Hello, my name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks, and we're very lucky today for our weekly uh, Weave online user group uh, to have speaker Rob Richardson, who will be talking about Docker for Windows container development. Uh, if this is your first time joining this Weave online user group, welcome. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a series that we've been doing uh, for couple of years now in different iterations. For this season, um, Stacy here on our call has been our community manager and has been putting up a great lineup of weekly talks and sometimes extra special edition talks on all kinds of topics around the container world, um, and Kubernetes, um, CICD, uh, and uh, if you've heard the term GitOps, which is a term our company coined, we've had a variety of talks on that. So uh, if you're coming back to our series, then welcome back. And uh, we look forward to our talk today. A little bit uh, quick note about our company. So our company is called Weaveworks and it's a startup based in San Francisco, London, New York, Berlin, uh, Colorado and with distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO, CTO and some of our engineers are the people who created the technology RabbitMQ and the company around it uh, and then sold it to VMware. And then they started noticing over time certain needs within the container space and created projects uh, and then eventually products uh, that led to the creation of the company WeaveWorks. We're VC funded by a variety of companies such as Excel Partners. Uh, one of our uh, uh, VCs is also Google Ventures, uh, which we just happened to mention because of its relevance to our dedication in the Kubernetes space. Uh, much of our company has been founded on open source. Uh, if you've heard of us before, you might know WeaveNet, which is, uh, continues to be the premier uh, project uh, around networking your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have Cortex, which has been the CNCF, which is built upon Prometheus and uh, makes it extendable and scalable. Uh, we also have Flux that's joined the CNCF most recently as a sandbox box project, and, and that provides automated deployments and kind of led to that term GitOps that we coined uh, specifically for Kubernetes. Uh, we've got plenty of others, uh, more than what's on this list, but you might have heard of Flagger, which is one of our recent ones, which uh, allows you to do canary deployments, uh, blue-green and uh, A-B testing by leveraging uh, service meshes or now actually not even requiring uh, service meshes. So that's been uh, a very popular project that's been taking off recently. Uh, and we also have products. Uh, so our longest product that we've had is called Weave Cloud. It's a SaaS product that helps you do Kubernetes management, monitoring, and automated deployments. Uh, to an extent, it's hosted versions of some of the open source projects that I men mentioned, uh, but then also having them integrated deeply um, and with obviously a UI. Uh, in particular, for example, you might set up your automated deployments and you can actually do the um, progressive delivery or like the canary deployments by leveraging Prometheus data so that you set those up and you're not man manually um, trying to divert traffic in a way. You set your specs and then you use the tool for that. So we've been running this uh, Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS in production for four years now. So obviously a lot of people who would come to talk to us would say, oh, that's pretty exciting that you actually have experience running Kubernetes in production for four years. Uh, so that led us to also productize um, our, the Kubernetes layer that we built to run our product on AWS. So we are currently in the process of productizing what we're calling now the Weave Kubernetes platform. Uh, and as the GitOps term and the methodology has really taken off uh, we're making sure that it's a very GitOps aware enterprise um, platform. Uh, and because we have experience, course, we do offer some consulting training and support for anybody who is on different parts of their Kubernetes uh, journey or their GitOps journey. So if you have any questions about that and this is your first time here, welcome. Our website is called weave.works uh, and you can certainly contact me and any of the follow-up emails if you'd like to learn more about um, our open source projects and our products. So as I mentioned, our talk today is Docker for Windows Container Development. We're very lucky to have Rob Richardson here, who is a principal software developer um, in the company that he runs, Richardson & Sons. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Tomo. I'm head of the developer experience team at Weaveworks. Uh, and we also have Stacey here, who's our community manager, who's been running these weekly Weave online user groups. Um, if you uh, have, if this is your first time, these sessions uh, can be as short as 30 minutes, uh, but I don't know if we've ever had a 30 minute session, but um, usually we have a talk and then some Q&A. So generally it runs about 45 minutes uh, to go through uh, the talk and all the questions. If 
sometimes there's a huge number and we have a lot to go through. We will go a little over, um, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. Uh, but generally, these are about 45 minutes long. Uh, if this is your first time using Zoom, this is the uh, platform that we're using to do this online talk. And uh, when you ask questions, uh, use the chat box. Uh, you should be able to find the button for the chat box. If you can't, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and it helps you see more of the dashboard functionality for Zoom and hopefully you can find the chat box. And a reminder that uh, when you do send a chat with your questions or sometimes maybe answers to other people's questions, make sure that you say to everyone, uh, otherwise people can't see your comments. So with that, I will hand it over to Rob and let me know if I need to stop sharing. Hi all. Those talks sound really cool. Uh, it looks like I can't share until you let okay, go. I will stop sharing. I will share. Those talks sound really exciting. Um, it's unfortunate we need to do this talk instead, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm excited to do this. This will be really fun. Towards that uh, 30 or 45 minutes, we'll probably push that boundary a little bit. We're gonna talk about Docker for Windows container development. And this is my one and only slide. <laughs> yes, slides in Notepad, that's awesome. So you can reach me at Rob underscore Rich on Twitter, or you can grab this presentation right now at robrich.org. Uh, typically, we'll, we'll, as presenters, we'll say, yeah, you can definitely grab my slides uh, tonight on my site, or you'll look tonight, you'll look tomorrow, and eventually you'll email me and you'll say, hey, can you, just, can you just present the slides, which is why they're online right now. Go to robrich.org, click on presentations here at the top, and here's Win Docker for Windows Container Development. You can click right here to get to the code that we will build um, on GitHub. And so we'll build it uh, live on stage. We'll start with nothing. But you can get to results that you can see right here. While you're there, you can click on About Me and see some of the things that I've done. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm a friend of Redgate. Uh, AZ Give Camp is wonderful. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We start building software Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software. If you're in Phoenix, come join us because AZ Give Camp is a lot of fun. Uh, I do training as a Microsoft uh, partner. Uh, both with uh, gitgrit.com in Docker and Kubernetes and in ASP.NET and Node. If you'd like me to do this for your company, I definitely can do that. One of the things I'm particularly proud of is uh, I replied to a .NET Rocks episode. They read my comment on the air and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! So that's my claim to fame as I have one of those coveted .NET Rocks mugs. So let's dig in. When we look at Dockerizing Windows content, we generally talk about uh, building things either for .NET Framework or for .NET Core. And we look at kind of migrating an existing project and migrating a new project. So let's start with a .NET Framework app. Um, .NET Framework. Let's look for web, ASP.NET Core. I'm going to come over here and grab my handy dandy quick uh, shortcut. Let's grab a .NET Framework app and we'll put it here in this empty folder. Empty or invalid solution name. That's interesting. Let's try that again. Okay. Well, you can put it wherever you'd like then. Nope. Ah, we're going to crash and burn. I'm going to start again. Let's create a new project in Visual Studio. A web application.net framework app. Web application one looks great. It's going to be .NET 4.7.2. And we'll build an MVC product. 
Now, typically we can check the Docker support box here. Once we've got Docker desktop installed, it will build all the things for us. But in this case, let's leave that unchecked and let's add Docker support later. So typically when we have an application, we'll have a website and we may have a backend service that does stuff. So you know, we may save the user's profile picture and then the backend service will resize that picture. Or we may have a front end service that queues up emails and then the back end service that actually sends those emails so that it can do retries and it can do um, other pieces there. So we've got our website. Let's add to this a uh, console application. And this console application will be a .NET framework app. Uh, service. Uh, worker service, that is uh, .NET Core. We'll start with a console app because that'll get it started. Console app, .NET Framework. They keep hiding these. <laughs> it's harder and harder to build a .NET Framework um, app. Console app.net framework. Let's see if we can grab a service app. Nope. Console app. Okay, so we have a console app for.net framework. Let's flip over to C sharp. Now this program will likely uh, derive from um, will likely have a Windows service in it. So here we've got this service one. We'll just copy this into place. Add class service one. And now this Windows service will have it do some interesting things. So when we started out, it was just service one. Um, and then we, we add a timer. And let's say on this timer, let's go do the thing that we need to do. So you know, we'll go do work. We'll go check our queue, or we'll go uh, send some emails. And so every time that timer elapses, then we'll go write the current time to the console. We have an on start method, we have a dispose method, and those will help us rig up the um, Windows service. Here in our program.cs, we'll probably have something that will start it. So we'll say service one equals new service, and then we'll hand that service to the runtime. In this case, let's just say service.start. So now we have a website and we have a backend service that is not that unlike an application that we would um, have in our existing system. It's a .NET Framework app, and we want to Dockerize this project. So the first step is we'll remove all of the servicey bits from this service. So we remove the uh, reference to the base class we'll remove the on start and on stop method. In this case, on start just turns on the timer, but you know, we won't have that pause and resume kind of content. So we've got our service ready to go. Here in program, right now it's just gonna on start, but we wanna keep this class alive. In Docker, we don't wanna start it in the background, rather we wanna have a foreground app that will do interesting things. So we'll say, well, True thread dot sleep 1000. And this 1000 milliseconds will just keep our application alive. Now we want to keep our application alive because Docker will monitor that.
process. And if ever that process gets stopped or aborted, then Docker knows that that service is unhealthy and it will kill off that container and start up a new one. Kubernetes will do similar things. When that process that it has launched stops, it will abort that process and, and begin again. Okay, so now next thing to Dockerize is to add a new item. I'm going to add a text file. And this text file will be a dot docker ignore. Now this docker ignore file lists all of the things that we don't want to copy into our container. So we don't want to copy bin, obj, star.user, star.suo, uh, the .vs folder. We can ignore other things like log or dump files. And we can expand this list to include anything that we don't want in our production container. Now, in this case, we're going to build inside of our container. So we do want to allow our source code in there. You'll notice that this looks a lot like a git ignore file. And in truth, it really is. It is a git ignore file. If Docker doesn't find a Docker ignore file, but does find a git ignore file, it will use that instead, which is actually really helpful. Next up, let's add a Docker file. Add new item. I'm going to add another text file, and I'm going to add a Docker file. Now, this Docker file very specifically is not dockerfile.txt, but rather just Docker file. We can rename this file to be whatever we'd like, but by convention, it is Docker file. I'll take a uh, moment right there. Any questions so far? Oops, sorry. Uh, nope, so far, no questions. Uh, and just reminding, we had some new people join. So if you have questions, please post it in the chat box. And welcome. Thank you for joining us. OK, so I want to craft this Docker file. I'm going to head out to Docker Hub, and I'm going to look for Microsoft.NET Framework here on hub.docker.com. What pops up here is a list of repos. And I want to, uh, we have an SDK, ASP.NET, a runtime. Samples is really cool if you want to dig into some example um, Docker files that do really interesting things. SDK looks interesting. SDK is uh, the things that will allow us to build. So let's open up this repo and get a sense of what content is here. Now here it lists various tags. So we can see that uh, here's the tags that they have available on Windows Server 1903 or Windows Server 2019. Uh, .NET Framework doesn't run on Linux, so we don't have any Ubuntu or Red Hat containers here. But what we see is this uh, tag right here. This looks great. Let's grab that repo name, and we'll start out with uh, from there. And then we'll also look at uh, an image name. Let's look at uh, runtime 4.8 server core LTSC 2019. So we see in the list of tags, there's 4.8, there's uh, 4.8 dash a whole bunch of things. We're going to use the one that is 4.8 Windows Server Core 2019 so that uh, we'll run on the latest version of Windows. So back inside Visual Studio, we'll list not only the base container, but we'll also list the version that we're going to use. And then we're going to copy in all of our content into our Docker container. Now, we're copying all the content from the current directory the directory that we'll launch the Docker file from into the current directory inside of our container. So there's a nice space in between here that isn't necessarily obvious. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to run ms build dash uh, c release. And here's the part where I always forget the ms build syntax. So let's go grab that.
There it is. MS build .NET Framework app .sln. So in this case, it was web application one .sln. We'll build in release mode and dash M says use as many processes as possible. So we'll do the build, but if we were to change any of these source code files, it, oh, actually let's do this, run uh, NuGet restore. We'll restore our NuGet packages for this project and then we'll run MS build. Now, because we've copied everything, then we run NuGet restore. If I change one of these text files, one of these CS files, I will rerun the NuGet restore. Ideally, we'll do that first. Let's do the NuGet restore and let Docker cache this layer so that then when we copy all the files, then we can run MS build. And if we're not uh, modifying our NuGet packages, then um, we don't need to re-download all the things. Well, now to get NuGet restore to be able to restore the things, we do need to copy in the web application 1.sln into the current folder. We need to copy Windows Service 1, uh, Windows Service 1.csproj into the current folder. And we also need to copy web application one, web application one dot CS proj into that, into place as well. Now, because we have these three files, now we can run NuGet restore, everything will restore, and then we'll copy in all of our source code. We're using Docker's layers here to be able to uh, increase our productivity. Now, when we only change source code, but we don't change our manifest, we don't need to re-download packages. Okay, next up, let's go. Uh, so we've got the build. We now have the final content. We'll have it inside the bin release folder. And so let's copy that content from the bin release folder into, I don't know, let's call that folder app. And let's also set this work dir to SRC. So now we copy slash SRC slash Windows service one slash bin release. We'll copy all of that content into the app folder. Well, it's actually not a copy. It's actually run X copy recursive. And now when we start it up, we'll say CMD and we'll say uh, Windows service one.exe. This CMD is a little bit different than the other Docker commands because this one starts when our uh, container starts up, where these other ones run as we build the Docker image. So we'll build the Docker image and we'll get all the way done with our Docker image, everything is ready to go. And then as we start that image, then we'll launch our service, which will do interesting things. That service will start up program.cs, we'll start up that service, we'll start it, and then we'll loop so that the service can do the work that it needs to do. Every time the timer elapses, then we'll get our output. Now this Docker file is great. This Docker file is perfect. We could use it exactly the way we do, but we notice that it may actually be a little bit bigger than we expect. Now it's bigger than we expect because we have the SDK in this container. We have all of our source code in this container. That's kind of a lot. So let's take a step back and say, well, can we start with just the runtime, just the .NET framework? Well, here's that .NET framework uh, Docker Hub image. And so we can grab that one. We'll use the same version of the image so we have the latest version of Windows. And now instead of copying it from elsewhere in the container, we'll actually copy it from this other image. Let's call this other image build. So I'm gonna reach into this build application. 
So let's call this as build. I'll go grab that content and copy it into place. And now this second image, we can think of this as our runtime production image. And we can kind of imagine this top part as our build server. We're going to copy our source code in. We'll do all of the building. And we'll produce the assets. Those assets are the things that we copy into place here and use it to start up our app. So that's perfect. Let's go into this folder. Open folder in File Explorer. And I'll grab that path. Docker build. I'm going to specify the file as Windows Service 1 Docker file dash T net framework service. We're going to build our image using the Docker file inside that service folder. And we're going to tag this as net framework service straight away. And we're going to build in this current directory, thus the final dot. So we're going to go build. And this will actually build up our application into a Docker container on Windows. Now, one thing that I did do while it's building, I did switch into Windows mode. Here, if you've installed it and you've installed it in uh, Linux mode, you can come in here and switch it to Windows mode. Here it says switch to Linux containers, which means I am in Windows mode. Unfortunately, .NET Framework doesn't run in uh, Linux mode. So we'll do that here in Windows mode. Any questions so far? Nope. Uh, I know some people join later, just actually in the last couple minutes. So uh, if you see the chat box and you have any questions about this, please ask us there. But so far, I haven't seen anything. Wonderful. So we've copied our content into place. We copied those three files. We're running NuGet Restore, and it's going to um, grab all of our NuGet packages from NuGet.org. And then we kick off the copy command. We'll copy the rest of our source code into place. Now we're going to run that MS build command. Here's the part where fingers crossed I didn't typo any of the CS files. We're building in release mode. That's perfect. Our build succeeded. Now we're going to start up that new production runtime container, copy that content into place, and we built our container successfully. Here's our container. It does have the tag latest, and that's a Docker convention that just says the one that didn't have a version. In most cases, we consider latest to be the latest one that we built, but it isn't necessarily that case. Docker run this object. And now we can see our container running. We're able to Dockerize that Windows service. Now we removed the Windows servicey bits. It doesn't actually run as a service. It runs as a console app. But because it runs as a console app, we can uh, monitor that process. Docker can say, hey, if that process is ever having any problems, let's evict that process and start up a new container. So here, once the application jitted, we can see it outputting the time correctly. That's great. So we're able to Dockerize this Windows service. Let's do similar things for this web application. Of course, like any good developer, we're going to copy and paste. Let's copy this file, 
copy, paste. We'll start with this Docker file, copy, paste. Now here in this Docker file, uh, that's probably enough things that we've got ignored. Everything works really nicely. Towards the Docker file, we're no longer building the Windows service, we're building the website. We're still doing the build on the website, but now we also need to do that piece where we say right click and publish. We need a new line that will run, I don't know, how do we, publish. Well, let's do that. If we come in here and we say publish, we can create a folder based publish to publish to bin release publish. That sounds great. And let's create that profile, but not publish immediately. That sounds great. Now we have in here this folder profile.pubxml. And we can leverage that to do the publishing piece. So reaching back into my notes, not that one. Here, reaching into my notes. Let's go grab that publish command. So we're going to do that run process, run, and that's MS build web application one. We'll do configuration as release, deploy build on true, publish profile equals folder profile, that folder profile that we just built. Now this uh, carrot on the end just says the line is continued. <laughs> uh, it's just Visual Studio wrapping the file. I could very specifically end that line and say, I would like to wrap that line onto the next line. But in this case, I don't mind one really long line. So we've deployed this content now into that bin release publish folder. So now here when I'm copying it, I'm not copying Windows service, I'm copying web application one, and I'm copying from that bin release, oops, bin release publish folder. And I'm no longer copying it to the app folder, but rather I'll copy it to that spot where Windows expects the content to be. Now, Windows in the IIS um, image, the ASP.NET image, has this uh, C inet pub www root folder. Now, if I put all of my content inside that www root folder inside the current directory, then it will launch that automatically if I'm using the ASP.NET image that has IIS installed. So IIS is already there, it already has a default website, and I'm just gonna stick my content into that spot. I'm gonna copy the assets that I created here in this run section into that current directory inside C inet pub www root. And so now I don't need a CMD command because this container already started IIS for me. So we've got another Docker file ready to go and we could do similar things. We could say um, docker build dash f web application one docker file dash t net framework site and we'll build from the current directory. And that would be interesting. This may take a bit. Um, oh, hey, that's pretty cool. We didn't need to rebuild this content. Rather, it used the cache. It used the cache because these steps were identical to our previous build. Docker already knew that it got those results. And so it can start with just copying content into place. It will run MS build. We could, uh, it will run the publish and it will ultimately build that production runtime container. Any questions so far? Nope, it's been a pretty silent group. That's wonderful. <laughs> Apparently I so, either explained yeah. things well enough or we're just totally lost. It's, 
Um, yes, so clear. Um, in fact, yeah, I was going to say if, you know, even if you join later and there's something you kind of just want to have a recap, just like an overview, let us know. Obviously, we can't go through all the details, but uh, if there's anything you just want to clarify so that you don't feel completely lost, let us know. But yeah, so definitely. Far, it seems like we're good. So we'll just let this run. Let's go back and look at that Docker file again. We see for the most part, there's four main commands that we look for in a Docker file. We have this from line that starts out from a base container. We'll go grab that base container from Docker Hub. We have the copy command that copies content from our uh, host machine into our image. We have the run command that will run uh, command line utilities as we build. And then we have the CMD command that runs content as the image starts up. When we get done with the build, we've done everything except for the CMD command. And then CMD is what we'll do to launch the container. Those are the four verbs, from, copy, run, and CMD. Now there's a lot more Docker file commands. You know, we see that we did work dir, we can set environment variables. There are a lot more things. But with those four commands, for the most part, you can read and start to write any Docker file that you see. That's really cool. Uh, as you find additional needs, definitely go dig into the Docker docs. They are really helpful in figuring out all the Docker commands. But we see that for the most part, with just those four commands, we were able to do interesting things. We did copy files into place and then uh, run NuGet restore so that we would see that content cached. And we did what's called a multi-stage build where we had this build server that had more content than we needed. And then we copied content from that build server into this production server so that our production runtime image would be a lot smaller. So that was really cool. Let's check in on our website. It looks like it's ready to go. And now let's run that. Docker run this. Now we do want to do a few additional commands here because we do want to be able to start up this web server and forward inbound traffic. So now it, the traffic will run on port 80 inside the container, but across the Docker switch, we want to proxy that to a different port on our machine because I've already got something running on port 80 on my machine. So I'm going to say this is on port 3000. If I hit port 3000 on my machine, it will proxy into port 80 in the container across the Docker switch. Let's launch that website. Oh. And I want to proxy the ports. <laughs> Let's start up that website. And then after IIS spins up, after the website JITS, we'll be able to visit localhost 3000 and see that website. Here's the part where spinning up a Windows machine and spinning up a, an IIS machine and uh, jitting content does take a little bit. Well, I'm going to kill that off and call that a demo fail. Docker container list. Here's the list of containers that we have running. And so we see that we have this container that is still starting up. And we still have that Windows service container that's been running for some time. We see that we've forwarded port 3000 from our local machine into port 80 on that, uh, in that container and that we started up from this image name, Net Framework Site and Net Framework Service. We also see some other interesting things. It assigned us a name, Heuristic Montalicini <laughs> and Charming Volhard. And we also have container IDs that are specific to this instance of the container. Now, how's that Windows service doing? I'm going to grab this container ID, Docker logs, 
and that container ID. And here's all of the logs that have gone to that container. It's been running for a few minutes. So we can see all of the logs that have gone to standard out or standard error. Docker container list. We can also look at the logs for this new website container. And there aren't any logs yet. That's great. Let's go hit localhost colon 3000 and see if that website is up. It looks like our machine is still spinning up. That's OK. So we spun up our containers. Now let's stop the containers. Docker container stop. Let's go stop the Windows service. And let's go stop the website. Now the containers are still around. They're just stopped. So let's go remove those containers as well. We'll remove our website container. And we'll remove the Windows service container. Now, the beauty of ephemeral hardware is those containers are now gone. All of the uh, details associated with that, anyone who uh, hacked the box, we were able to grab the logs before we removed them. And so now we can spin up new hardware, and we know it is exactly what we expected. Docker container list. I'm going to list all containers. And we see that right now we have no containers running on our system at all. That's great. So towards taking a legacy .NET Framework app, we can go add a Docker file and a Docker ignore file. We can set it in a container, both a website and a service, and we can get our application running inside Docker. Well, now let's switch over to .NET Core and take a look at, well, what if we had a, a .NET Core project that we created with Docker in mind straight away? So I'm going to grab an ASP.NET Core website. Let's see if we can set it in place here in this .NET Core folder. Oh, that's the solution name, not the location. OK, .NET Core app. Web Application 1 sounds like a perfect name for this website. And now as I create my web application, I'm going to choose Model View Controller, and I'll choose ASP.NET Core 3. I'm going to check this Enable Docker Support. Now by checking this, it will rig up all of the content that we need to build this into Docker straight away. Let's create this project, and let's take a look at this uh, site. So we've got this web application. And with this web application is this Docker file. It's going to spin up a Docker ignore file as well. And because we picked Windows containers as we spun this up, then we see that we're building against the 3.0 nano server 1903 base image. Now we've got a little bit more going on in this Docker file than in the Docker file we built. They have more uh, multi-stage builds. Uh, here's a build one, which will, uh, this uh, image will do the publishing. This image will do the building. We may have a separate image for doing testing. So they have a little bit more moving parts. But for the most part, we've got that same process. We get to the end, and we have this CMD command that will run our application. Let's do another one. We'll add our Windows service. And this will be a .NET Core console app. 
And we'll do a similar thing. I can come right here and I can say add Docker support and it will go add in that Docker file and .docker ignore file. It'll ask me what target OS I want and it will add that content into place. Now this Docker file is a little bit uh, swirly as well. It gets through all of the steps, but eh, you know, arguably I would make that Docker file a little bit simpler. In both cases, we also now have a docker ignore file that ignores all of the things that we don't want to be part of this application. Here inside this program, we will go add a service as well, add a new item, and we will add service one. And inside this service one class, we will likely do similar things. We'll spin up a timer. On that timer, we'll do some work. In this case, the work that we're doing is just outputting the current time. We'll enable and disable that timer as we need to. And then here in program.cs, we'll kick off that timer. Again, Docker is gonna monitor that process. So we'll create a, an infinite loop that will keep our process alive. while true thread dot sleep for a second. And that will keep our process alive so that Docker knows that our process is still going. So now we've got all of the pieces to be able to do a similar thing. We could come back to the console and we could say docker build and we could kick off those things. And then we could say docker run and do all of those things. But while we're inside Visual Studio, let's take it a step farther. Now here, while I've got web application one selected, I can choose how I would like to start that application. I can choose to start it with IIS Express or with Cassini running that program.cs directly, or I can choose to start in Docker. Now, when I choose to start in Docker, we could see that as we started it up, here's the Visual Studio launching the Docker run for us. It started up that container and it ran real Docker commands. Here's it running each of those steps, real Docker commands. This isn't Microsoft brand Docker, this is real Docker. I'll do that here with Windows Service One as well. I'll set that as a startup project and I'll ensure that I've got Docker selected there as well. Now that I've got both of them set as Docker, let's set startup projects. And instead of just starting one project, we'll start up multiple projects. Let's start up both of them. Now I'm gonna start both projects and I'll set a breakpoint in interesting places. Let's set a breakpoint here as we do the work with each website. And let's set a breakpoint here in our home controller where we go visit the index page. Now I'm gonna start up multiple projects and Docker here is gonna do, Visual Studio will kick off those Docker commands to be able to run this content in place. Here's that Docker exec where it's gonna jump into that container. Hey, Rob, just want to check in in terms of a time check. <laughs> so we have, Good call. Uh, we're 10 minutes to the last. Speaking of breaks. We've got we 10 minutes left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Let us know how it's going. Any questions so far? I haven't seen any. Uh, yeah, and a reminder. So uh, in the beginning, as I mentioned, these are usually about 45 minutes long. But if the, like, the presentation is longer, there are questions. Uh, we'll go to the uh, hard stop at the end of the hour. So yes, we have one question. Um, what shall be done to publish? Oh, so how do you publish this to the cloud? Good call. How do I publish this to the cloud? Once we built that container, 
and we have the container in our image list. Um, actually, <laughs> we just hit our breakpoint inside of our container running inside Visual Studio. Then let's come back to how to publish to the cloud. So I've got that breakpoint, and I can start to uh, examine variables inside my application just as I normally would. But we're very specifically running here inside of a container. Let's go hit, uh, here's our website. And we hit our breakpoint inside of our website as well. If I say Docker container list, I can see that I've got those two containers, one listening here on this port that we launched into, by the way, it's using HTTPS, and we've got our Windows service running as well. We're able to use that same normal debugging experience that we're used to, that same build and publish type of experience that we're used to, but now we're running inside of Docker containers. Here's our console output showing us that our Windows service is running just fine. So we've got our content. Now, how do we get it to the cloud? I'll typically uh, spin up a, either an Azure Container Registry or an Amazon Container Registry, and then I'll do a Docker push my website, net framework uh, site, to that remote service. At that point, now I can use it either in Azure Web Apps or in um, Azure Kubernetes service or in any managed Docker service to be able to leverage that content in production. That Docker push command is that last piece to get it into place. Now, if I have, for example, my, um, my Azure Container Registry is actually Rob Rich, so I may need to say Docker tag net framework site as robrich.azurecr.io slash net framework site. And now I can say Docker push azurecr.io net framework site, and that is ready to go. I then plug in this as my Docker uh, image name into Azure Web Apps, and everything launches just fine. That was a great question. What other questions do we have right here? So we're down to the last couple of minutes. <clears throat> um, Rob, do you have more that you'll be covering or? Nope. What we There's saw things. was whether I'm starting with a legacy site or whether I'm starting with a brand new site, Visual Studio and Docker allow us to be able to build really excellent content and to deploy it in any cloud that we need to. Docker is that modern container platform for being able to run applications everywhere. Whether I'm using Docker natively inside Docker Swarm or whether I'm using it inside of another orchestrator like Kubernetes, I can definitely migrate my content off of our pet servers into the cloud in a really elegant way. Awesome, yeah. This is actually, we'll, we'll tell our friends over at, uh, at Microsoft that this, I didn't know that there was going to be so much of a, a, a demo part of the Visual Studio, so it's kind of cool. And, uh, yes. So if anybody has any last questions, uh, if it's okay, Rob, I'll switch over to our closing slides. Sure, let me stop sharing. Let me, oops. Here. So if you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat. And in the meantime, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, if this is your first time coming to our Weave Online user group, welcome. Um, we have great speakers such as Rob uh, on these series. Currently, they're um, every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, here are some of the upcoming uh, talks that we have from people in our team here at WeaveWorks, as well as you can see these guest speakers. Uh, and uh, you'll be getting an email after this. Uh, we talked about the concept of GitOps. If you're interested in an ebook that we have, here's some information. And if uh, you have f further questions for us, uh, we'll send you these links on how to join our Slack channel. Uh, and Rob shared his uh, contact info as well if you have questions specifically for him. Uh, if you want to know about the calendar, this meetup uh, URL is our best 
single source of truth where we have our event calendar and all the various online talks that we have coming up. So with that, I do see something popping up. Just want to make sure. So we have. I see one more question in chat. Here. Do we have a minute to address it? Yes, let me paste it for everyone to see. Uh, so yeah, uh, just generally a question about this Visual Studio. Uh, is the use case similar to um, Linux or on a Mac? And yeah, definitely. We looked very specifically at the Windows development experience. But if I switch over Docker into Linux containers and use Visual Studio Code or Sublime or uh, Eclipse or IntelliJ, I can be able to build my content there and we'll use a Docker file that is exactly the same. It will just then run um, Linux commands instead of Windows commands to be able to package the content, copy our manifest into place, um, run our build, and ultimately be able to publish to uh, an image, uh, publish to the cloud in the normal way. The Docker experience is identical whether you're a Windows user or a Linux user. That's helpful. Any last question? OK. This well, was a lot of fun. You. If you want to grab yeah. me, grab these slides from robrich.org or tweet me at rob underscore rich. This was a lot of fun to present. Thanks for having yeah. me out. Uh, and um, if you uh, missed last time that Rob presented, uh, you can definitely call out to us. We have our YouTube channel that also should be in the follow-up email. So you can see all of these videos from our past speakers, such as Rob. And we're already chatting about maybe a future talk next year. So we're looking forward to that. It's always great having you, Rob. Thanks. It's a, cool. It was a lot of fun presenting today. I look forward to presenting again. Yes, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And we'll see you at future events. See you. Bye-bye.